art and mass culture. Um, in this lecture, we will discuss Chapter 5, Photography, Part 1. Overview, how do photographs convey information? We will start with a brief discussion of the use of photographs as evidence or truth, and then talk about the differences between a photograph of a scene or person and our direct experience of the same scene or person. In a photograph, the photographer selects the camera angle and point of view. The photographer can exclude anything they don't want in the image. Photographs are two-dimensional and stop time. More, most importantly, the act of looking at a photograph is a one-way activity. The subject of the photograph can't look back at the viewer. Then we will consider the three things necessary for the invention of photography to occur. One, the camera obscura. Two, chemistry to fix the light sensitive image. And three, photographic vision. We will look at the painted artwork of the painter Angre. Angre demonstrated photographic vision in his painting and helped the newly important and expanding middle class establish their own social vision. Through Ang's paintings, we will also discuss the use of female sexuality, or the female nude, to advertise his artwork and attract buyers. In the early years after photography was invented, nudity in painting and photography were regarded very differently. How did Ang reinforce traditional gender roles in his portraits? All right, let's start the lecture. Photography as evidence or proof. We so often equate the photograph with reality that photographs are offered as evidence, as proof, in the public forum of the mass media. You can consider the video of George Floyd's murder as a very vivid example of photographic or video-based evidence of truth. Without the incontrovertible photographic evidence of the circumstances surrounding his death, our discussion of his murder might be very different. This is by no means a recent phenomenon. Only a few decades after the first photographic process had been patented in 1839, photographs of the Paris Communards, the socialist revolutionaries who seized the city in 1871, were used by the government when it regained control to identify individuals to be executed. Since then, photographs have been integral in establishing veracity of both popular opinion and legal courts. However, as communication theorists Marita Sturkin and Lisa Cartwright assert, the notion of photographic truth hinges on the idea that the camera is an objective device for the capturing of reality. Yet, photographic images are highly subjective cultural and social artifacts that are influenced by the range of human belief, bias, and expression. There are profound and significant differences between direct physical experience, that is what we call reality, and photography. How is seeing a photograph not the same as the real experience of seeing? What are the differences between looking at an image of a person and looking at the person directly? The artist chooses and frames the image. Every time you see a photographic image, it has been selected and composed by the photographer. If you were there, you would see something different. Whereas, second, whereas photography appears to stop time, reality constantly changes. As a photograph is a fixed image, but reality is in perpetual flux. In a photograph, only one of our senses, vision, is engaged. But in reality, we use all of our senses. If you were there in person, you would hear things, touch things, and smell things. Differences between photographs and direct experience. There are many other differences between photographs and direct experience. Photographs are flat, two-dimensional, but reality operates in three-dimensional space. Of course, uh, we see colors in reality, and many times photos are made in black and white. Translating the color of an image changes its content, it also changes our perceptions of its content. Perhaps most important of all is the fact that looking at photographs is a one-way activity. When we look at an image of a person, no matter their expression, no matter their apparent action, the object of the photographic gaze cannot look back. 
The subject cannot respond to or control our act of looking. Made passive and fixed by the camera, the subject is presented to be captured and consumed by our gaze. Susan Sontag reminds us that photographs are a way of imprisoning reality, understood as recalcitrant, inaccessible, of making it stand still. One can't pr possess reality, but one can possess and be possessed by images. Sontag is critical of some artist's work, saying that it is based on distance, on privilege, on a feeling that what the viewer is asked to look at is really other. As we survey the history of photographic images, we need to con continue considering the relationships between photography and truth, photography and aggressive visual possession, and photography and the other. Pre-photography, -pho pre three elements. The invention of photography involved the connection of three elements. The first element was the camera obscura, which, as we have noted, was known and used by artists for centuries. Art historians were certain that Johannes Vermeer used one in the 17th century, and camera obscuras were popular artist tools by the 18th century. It is easy to convert a camera obscura into a camera. Many of the first photographers used these converted camera obscuras to take their first photographs. Camera obscura, the name literally means dark room. Based on the principle that a small hole in a box produces an upside down image on the side of the box opposite the, the hole, called a pinhole camera, these were manufactured by the Dutch starting in the 17th century. They had added lenses and mirrors to turn the image right side up, and it was used, they were used as drawing aid for artists so they could get the perspective correct. And here are pictures of uh, several different versions of the camera obscura, some more elaborate and some basically just a wooden box with a lens. And you will remember the painting um, by the Dutch artist Vermeer in which Vermeer uses the camera obscura to create uh, the correct perspective. And this painting by Vermeer called The View of Delft, also using the camera obscura for per perspective. And you might remember that Vermeer in emphasizes these circles of confusion from the lenses of the camera obscuras. He likes them so much he adds more of them to the painting. All right, the second element needed for uh, photography is chemistry or fixer. The second element was the chemistry that allowed an image projected by light to be permanently fixed. The chemistry anticipated photography's invention by some time as well. As early as the 1600s, it was observed that powdered nitrate of silver blackened when exposed to the sun. By the beginning of the 19th century, Thomas Wedgwood was conducting experiments that allowed him to capture silhouette images, but he couldn't make them permanent. Eventually, Daguerre and Talbot found chemicals to fix photographic images. The third event element needed was the development of photographic vision. The third element necessary for the invention of photography was the development of photographic vision. We have examined many steps that led to the development of this vision. The purpose of art before photography was invented was precisely to improve upon nature. Art humanized nature. It did not just passively record it. The total, totally objective images produced by the photographic camera generally do not have this sense of composition that was considered to be an essential element of art. All right, Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre, uh, Academic Painting Before Photography. One of the most important artists to see and paint in the language of photography was Angre a star pupil of Jacques-Louis David. David had given the Academy a more democratic form during the French Revolution. He also opened up the salons. David further revised the Academy and salon system under Napoleon, continuing the process toward the progress toward openness initiated earlier. The relatively increased democratic tenor of the Academy is reflected in the fact that of the 410 artists represented in the Salon of 1808, 50 were women. 
After Napoleon's fall, Angra took over as director of the academy. Following the example of David under Napoleon, Angra produced paintings that glorified the center of power in the new social order. And this is the middle class or the bourgeoisie. The academy and its system, salon system had a long history as the main force in French art by the time photography became an artistic concern in 1839. The paintings of Angra revealed how the photograph, when it publicly appeared in 1839, could fit right into the academic style of painting and ultimately became its chief rival. Classicizing the middle class. Academic painting in the early decades of the 19th century provides a particularly significant picture of how the bourgeoisie saw the world and how they saw themselves. One of the most important needs of the politically dominant middle class was for validation of its new position of power. The newly arrived businessmen and industrialists wanted to appear, appear as a direct extension of the traditional society they had overturned and replaced. Since scenes from classical mythology and history had been the main themes of traditional aristocratic painting, Angra used similar themes to classicize the bourgeoisie. Academic paintings thus had the icon function of portraying the middle class as the heroic element maintaining the new social order. All right, the use of female beauty or sexuality to advertise Angra's paintings. Anger exhibited his paintings at the Academy Salons in Paris, where they were viewed by people from all over the Western world. People traveled from far and wide to attend. The Academy Salon was the big visual cultural event of the year. Think Sundance. There were so many paintings that artists had to compete for people's attention. Angra solicited the attention of wealthy, wealthy patrons using some of the same devices used by advertisers today. In an effort to make their ads stand out in the tsunami of images that constantly flood over us, many advertisers deploy female beauty and sexuality in eroticized compositions. Angra's La Source portrays a young woman standing in a forest clearing with a large vase balanced on her shoulder. Ostensibly, she is a portrait of one of the classical muses, the female embodiments of artistic inspiration who were linked with springs as their own sources. In reality, of course, Angra's figure is a full frontal nude displayed for the consuming gaze of pres presumably heterosexual male viewers. Young and lovely, her body is as flawless as any airbrushed or digitally manipulated image of a fashion model today. According to the standards of the Academy, such nude images were acceptable precisely because they were unreal. They were idealized, distanced over time, and elevated as mythological figures. On the other hand, photographed images of female nudes, the type we can refer to as pornography, were not acceptable for public viewing. They were too closely linked to the real because they weren't idealized, distanced, or mythologized. To make this image, the photographer had to be standing in a room with a nude woman. Nevertheless, such photographs were embedded in the same system that produced the art and thereby embedded many of the same cultural values. An anonymous 19th century photograph um, labeled Buy Some Apples portrays a frontally nude woman whose body and facial expression seem to echo those of Angra's La Source. Both the painted and photographed women have body types favored by 19th century taste and blank, vacuous expressions that empty them of any subjectivity. That the photographed woman is intended to be consumed by the male gaze is confirmed by her pose. She carries a tray of apples at chest level so that her breasts are compared to the ripe fruit being offered. Angra, uh, the Grand Odalesques. This painting was shown by Angra in the Salon of 1819. And it caused quite a scandal at the time. 
because this is not a classicized version of Venus or another traditional historical nude. It is an anonymous portrait of a nude woman in a harem and as such did not have an accepted place in the academic salon. Nevertheless, it was a very popular painting at the time, and it still is. Portraits by Ang, The Faces of the Middle Class. The most impressive paintings by Ang were not the classical salon machines. These are these portraits that he did for every salon competition, but his brilliant portraits of upper middle class society. Indeed, his salon paintings can be seen as demonstrations of his skills as promotional pieces advertising his considerable pictor pictorial abilities that serve to secure commissions from his middle class audience. All right, so we're going to look at his portrait of Madame Moitessier. Uh, Ang's portrait of Madame Moitessier uh, presents a person whose eminently self satisfied expression was highly representative of the successful middle class and its values. The painter's style brilliantly expresses the middle class quest for property and order. His style is a study in the restraint prized by the middle class. Every form has its clear outline. Nothing is left to chance. Emotion, when it appears, is sheltered below a surface as controlled and polished as a mirror. The factual clarity of his style also stresses the middle class love for fact a love that was to find even more fulfillment in the photograph. And some people say that that's why photography became so popular so fast, was that the middle class loved the very factual nature of photographs. The portrait of Madame Moitessier shows the painter's skill at rendering an almost photographic likeness. Like an airbrushed yearbook photograph, however, the features give little hint of personal character or feeling. Anger frames the smoothed out face and plump but dainty hands with a properly sober background and color scheme tastefully relieved by uh, hints of wealth in the jewelry and clothing. All right, and so let's compare a middle class portrait to an aristocratic portrait also by Ang. The iconic experience of Ang's paintings is seen in his um, in this portrait. Um, one has no way of knowing that this beautiful lady was an aristocrat. Um, in contrast to the middle class Madame, Madame um, Moitessier, unless one reads the title of the painting, academic painting illustrated and enforced the new social reality. The dethroned arist aristocracy imitated the fashionable dress of the upper middle class, the new aristocracy of industrial capitalism. The two are very similar despite the class differences, the class status differences. Ang was aware that both classes could pay his fee and that the middle class wanted to be depicted in a similar way to the aristocracy to establish their place in history, in society. Anger and the middle class. Thus, Anger presents a kind of double portrait of the middle class. The mythic paintings, heroic but sentimentalized, show their pretensions and aspirations. The portraits show their proudly practical, energetic side, the real strength of the new middle class social order. It is important to note that Anger continued to display traditional gender roles in his portraits. The men of Anger's portraits are portrayed as dynamic men of action, and the women were portrayed as beautiful and passive objects to be looked at. All right, so we're moving on um, to, toward photography, and we're going to discuss a new artist tool, which was called the Camera Lucida, or the Lightroom. One of the tools Anger may have employed was the Camera Lucida. Invented around 1807, the Camera Lucida is simply a four-sided prism mounted on a flexible metal stem. When an artist looks through the prism at the subject, it appears that an image of the subject is projected on a piece of paper directly below the prism. The image is virtual, not actual, but if the artist remains still so that the subject is viewed from exactly the same position, the image can be traced. Camera Lucida generated drawings are said to have intense, almost photographic particularity. 
And here you can see the Camera Lucida in action. This is a mechanical aid to help artists draw from nature more effectively. And apparently they were quite difficult to use. The Clam Lucida, another device that would help artists to draw from nature, is available from around 1807. It is called the Lightroom or Camera Lucida instead of Darkroom or Camera Obscura. It consists of a prism with two silver sided uh, set on a rod. You were supposed to be able to see the scene you were looking at and the paper at the same time so you could trace the scene easily on the paper. So it allowed you to look out and down at the same time. Like I said, they were notoriously difficult to use. And here you can see a camera Lucy the sketch by Sir John Herschel. So he was looking out at this scene through that little prism and as he looked out he was also looking down and his he could trace what he saw through the prism. All right, the invention of photography. Frenchman Joseph Nicephore Nieps may have created the first fixed photographic image in the summer of 1826. Now, I just want to pop in a little note. Even though this is a photograph and it's from 1826, we're not going to we're going to count the year that photography was invented as 1839 or the year that it was first patented. So just remember that there's a little gap there. Um, his fuzzy, awkward composition of village roo rooftops required an eight-hour exposure. Two years later, he met Louis Daguerre, and the two men formed a partnership. Um, Nieps died unexpectedly in 1833, and Daguerre took his research and used it to invent his own process. All right, and here's a portrait, a Daguerre-type portrait, of uh, Louis-Jacques Mondé Daguerre, and this is from 1844. Uh, Louis-Jacques Mondé Daguerre. He did not have much formal education. He was a wise um, and sagacious uh, businessman, outgoing personality, ambitious. He owned a successful theater business called the Diorama, which had used special effects and lights. And he works to invent a photographic process. He figures out that he has a latent image. He partners with Nieps and he invents his own process, which he calls the daguerreotype, and named after himself, of course. And you can remember that he was from the middle class and he understood the value of including his own name in something that he wanted to market. And we'll see that that's different from Talbot, who um, is from the wealthy class and does not name his process after himself. All right, and this is um, one of the uh, the di dioramas um, Daguerre ran. It was a big theater where people would come and, and sit and watch these uh, pictures pre-photographically. All right, in 1839, Daguerre announced his photographic process, a process he mod modestly called the Daguerreotype, to the French public. One of Daguerre's early images was shot from his Paris studio window, looking down at the street below. Because the exposure time for early daguerreotypes was so long, Daguerre did not capture the images of any people or carriages moving in the street. The only human figure visible is the man uh, standing on the corner getting his shoes shined, and there is some conversation which says Daguerre may have paid this man um, to stand there. Apparently he stood and talked to the shoeshine boy long enough to be one of the first person people ever photographed. Um, daguerreotype images were shockingly real. They were very detailed and they looked very real. And here you can see a larger version of the uh, view of the Boulevard du Temple. This is from 1839 and here is uh, that man standing uh, to get his shoes shined. All right, the daguerreotype technique, um, however, had several drawbacks. It produced a one-of-a-kind image, so there was just one image, um, a positive image on a metal support. Um, if you're familiar with the Polaroid process, um, you, you might it's kind of the same idea. And it also involved the use of highly toxic chemicals, including hot mercury, which is really bad for you. And you can see here that um, the daguerreotype is here. It has a mirrored surface. And they put them in these little cases with velvet, um, oops, and a piece of glass um, to protect it. B 
be so that the metal surface wouldn't get uh, scratched. All right, and now we're going to move on to our second inventor, whose name is William Henry Fox Talbot. And if you remember, um, he was from the wealthy class, and we'll see that he does not name his photographic process after himself. All right, um, it was Englishman William Henry Fox Talbot who invented the positive-negative photographic process that allows multiple original images to be printed from the negative. Talbot had used the camera Lucida, but had been frustrated by his lack of drawing skills. Um, by 1835, um, Talbot had used the camera obscura to create a negative image of the window of his home at Lecoq Abbey um, in Wiltshire. This is in England. He inserted the images in his journal and wrote beside it, Latticed window with the camera obscura, eight, August 1835, when first made, the squares of glass, about 200 in number, could be counted with the help of a lens. Talbot realized he could create a positive image by essentially making a photograph of the negative. Uh, only a few weeks after Daguerre's announcement in France, William Henry Fox Talbot announced to the Royal Institute of Drawing that he had discovered a method of what he called photogenic drawing. He called his process the calotype, and this is from the Greek um, kalos for beauty, beautiful. And here you can see, I know it's a really bad picture, but if you used a magnifying glass, you could see all the tiny panes um, in the, the window. And of course, this is a negative image. So what's normally light, the, the light coming in through the window is, is black. And what's normally dark, which is the inside of the window, the inside of the building, is light in this, um, in this negative image. All right, Talbot realized he could create a positive image by essentially making a photograph of the negative. Oh, I already did this one, sorry about that. Um, okay, and this is his book. So five years later, Talbot published The Pencil of Nature, the first commercial book illustrated with actual photographs. And this is the cover of the book and the title page. And here is his studio. So in order to make all the prints for the book, he set up a photographic processing studio. Um, and here you can see um, you can see the converted camera obscura with the lens sitting on this kind of a crude tripod. And you can see the man being propped up because they had to sit still for such a long time. And then here you can see he's using the negative that he made um, and sandwiching it with another piece of paper in order to make a positive image. And uh, there's no fancy shutter or anything. He's just taking off the lens cap. And sometimes you see them holding a little clock because um, these um, images would be several minutes long. All right, William Henry Fox Talbot. Later in his life, Talbot assessed his contribution. He said, quote, I do not profess to, uh, to have perfected an art, but to have commenced one, the limits of which it is not possible at present exactly to ascertain. And of course, even today, we can't ascertain the limits of photography. All right, Hippolyte Bayard. As soon as Daguerre and Talbot published their photographic inventions, a host of others from all over the world, as far away as Brazil and Norway, claimed to have produced fixed images before 1839. But again, I just want to caution you that for the purposes of, say, a quiz in this class, you want to remember 1839 as that uh, lucky number for the invention of photography. The most luckless pioneer was Parisian clerk Hippolyte Bayard, who, exa who exhibited 30 of his photographs in July of 1839. His technique produced one-of-a-kind direct positives uh, based on the chemical reactions of silver chloride, potassium iodide, and sunlight. And again, here it's all about who you know. Uh, Daguerre had gotten in with the French government, and so, of course, they uh, championed his process over Bayard's. Um, overlooked by both the authorities and the public, Bayard protested the inequities of history in his 1840 image, Self-Portrait of a Drowned Man. On the back of the print, he wrote, The body you see is that of Mr. Bayard, the Academy, the King, and all who have seen his pictures admired them, just as you do. Admiration brought him prestige, but not a single dollar. The government, which gave Mr. Daguerre so much, said it could do nothing for Mr. Bayard, and the wretch drowned himself. 
Since the man who photographed and commented was obviously still alive, the image is a misrepresentation, one of the earliest proofs that photographs do not always tell the truth. I also like it because it's really one of the first self-portraits. And it's a nude image of a man rather than a woman, which is uh, very um, uh, you know, unusual in early photography. All right, the relationship between photo photography and art. The photograph fulfills the dream, first implied by Brunelleschi's paintings of the Baptistry of Florence, of creating an optically exact picture of reality. It also e echoes Roger Bacon's medieval vision of pictures based on the true geometry of nature. Nevertheless, photography also presented a dilemma undreamed of by Brunelleschi. What is the role of art if a machine can produce such a realistic image? During the period between 1839 and 1905, Western artists struggled with this question, directly and indirectly. Their struggle generated two opposing kinds of response. One, that of academic painting, used perspective to create an art that imitated the optical realism of photography. The other, avant-garde art, broke with the perspective tradition and began to create new artistic languages that ultimately opened up new views of reality as well as new views of art. All right, thanks. That's the end of part one.